Otis Elwood Toole was a self-confessed serial killer and cannibal who admitted to many murders and was the suspect in many more unsolved murders, some of which he committed with his friend Henry Lee Lucas. Toole was convicted of murder twice and confessed to four more murders, for which he was convicted by a court of law. Toole died of cirrhosis at the Florida State Prison on September 15, 1996, at the age of 49. His body went unclaimed, and he was buried in the Florida State Prison Cemetery. This is his last interview on death row. What, what do you prefer in life? Uh, sex or fire? Well, I like both. <laughs> <laughs> I like both. Baby is, baby is. I'm a, what you call a, a power maniac. A power maniac can be uh, most anything, but I'm what you call a, a power maniac. A whole, a whole city burned down. A whole city. I like to see a whole city. About uh, the tallest building I could see. Up. I like to see a whole thing. Do I? What do you feel when you see it? What do you feel? <laughs> <laughs> First few times. Just like I said, just like talking to them, it's just like that. Once you get into it, ain't nothing to do. Just like the drinking a cup of coffee, smoking a cigarette. Once you get into the habit, you do it more and more. It's just a steady, steady thing. I mean, some people do it. from Henry? The miserable lovers, you say. But that 
that loved him in the hate. He killed that bitch out of ketchup. And I cut his dick off and shut his, his mouth. And then take a baseball bat and run it straight through his, from his mouth to his ass. Just deep as I can jump. I had to take like a, like a stop, run it all the way down. And let it come out of his ass. And then put him on a barbecue pit. And all them police out there on the street. And don't even tell us a dead person, you know. After they eat it and then say, well, you just ate a human body, you see. That's what I would do. And that's what I am. Ain't no pass. But I don't understand myself. You got to understand yourself before you can understand anything else. I just from one stand. How many victims do I have told them? I believe it's 12. Okay. And I would have to really sit down and, and, and think about that. Most of my victims are girlfriend, children. Okay. Why did nothing come of it when the children told? Well, um, like one of my victims, she was she was rather wild, and it's uh, to have a victim like that, it's very easy to make liars out of them because they don't want to tell what they've been doing to start with. You know, it's kind of like if you tell on me, I tell on you. Did you find people easy or hard to fool? It depends on whether they care or not. You know, if, if people in general, they're going to think what they want to think. And that's just basically all there is to it. I mean, if they want to think bad of you, they're going to think bad of you. If they hear something bad of you and they kind of believe it, they're going to believe it. And if they don't, they don't. Mm -hmm. And s something like that, it's hard to believe. Uh, in the business I was in, you know, uh, this guy works around children all the time. If he was molesting children, you know, there's no way he couldn't get caught. What was your business? I was a night manager of a grocery store. I was in the public a lot. I led a double life. I mean, the store was, and I was an entirely different person. The, uh, maybe not so much an attitude of the way I acted, but I could honestly be me. You know, I could be a, a, a productive person. Mm -hmm. and a, a decent person in the community. It was a place where I could say I'm a decent person. You know, when I went home, I had to face this again. You know, I'm not a decent person. I'm an indecent person. I do immoral things. And it was like, you know, and you get it work. For me, if I got it work, you know, I loved work. I loved to stay at work because I didn't have to go back home and face my real self. When I was first asked the question, when she first asked me the question, if I did molest her, Mm -hmm. And it was like electricity run through my body. You know, it's like being really, I just really got nervous. So basically it was to get over the nervousness because that's the first telltale sign, you know, is being really nervous and perspiring and such as that. Mm -hmm. uh, quiver is in my voice as it is right now. I mm -hmm. wouldn't be, you know, I would have worked through that already. It was basically, you know, if the guy really didn't care, it was kind of like an adult conversation, you know, like, uh, you know, come on, guy, you know I'm not going to do anything like that. You know me. If, if I was talking to somebody I knew, and uh, I would use my job, you know. Look, I've been around children all my life, you know. Uh, if I was going to molest a child, don't you think I'd pick a child outside my home and not have it in my home with me all the time? How do I fool people? You it's a hard you one. You know, I, I I guess I don't don't really know how to fool them. Just stare them straight in the eye and just tell them, just answer their questions when they ask you. Basically, it's not to be nervous and to look someone in the eye. If you can get to grasp to look someone in the eye because that's, you know, you, that's something that's driven in your head all your life. If somebody looks in your eye, you know, they're telling you the truth. So... If you can stare someone in the eye and tell them a lie, they'll, they're going to say, well, you know, the guy didn't even blink, he didn't look away, he's pretty straight here. 
plus you know he's he's pretty good in the community he's uh worked at this store 12 15 years or he's worked at his business 12 15 years and you know basically if you can stay calm and look whoever it is in the eye and especially if the mother of the victim or the or the victim there if the victim is anywhere that you can look at her and make her nervous or him whichever one it might be the more nervous that you make them the more it makes it seem like they're lying if they're around you know most of the time they're not to just a simple look to a child is traumatizing as you believe it or not it, it really is especially if if the adult is molesting the child if this one had gone to court do you believe you would have been convicted or do you believe that a jury would have taken your word over the child's in my mind, in my mind, I probably would think that uh, I would have gotten away with it because I could sit there and if she was in the courtroom, which sometimes they do, you know, they do bring them in sometimes and sometimes they don't. And I know when we went to the, uh, the hearing, she wouldn't even come in the courtroom. And when she did come in, when she looked at me, I just looked back at her and I really didn't even give her any kind of insinuation with my look, you know, I just just basically looked at her and uh, she went right back out of the courtroom and if we had went to the court on you know if we had went to court and we both had been in the courtroom at the same time then I could have made her nervous enough to make her lie or make her stumble to make people think she was lying I had uh, 53 hands-on definite victims uh, and there are uh, 40, uh, 42 other ones that can be questioned as far as uh, age and so forth is concerned. Uh, they, but I have 53 minor victims. In fact, did you molest Mikey? Yes, I did. I molested, yes, I molested Mikey uh, on uh, numerous occasions throughout a three-year period from the time beginning at nine until he was 12 years old. Uh, Mike, uh, I knew Michael before he began coming to the congregation where I attended. Um, he was, I worked many times with the uh, people in his area uh, with, with problem children. Um, as a younger, as an older teenager, I would go out and, uh, and assist people um, in, the, in the boys' homes and so forth the, for little small things like uh, baseball games, softball games, etc. And as a matter of fact, I chose him because he was as a victim, because he was a problem child, because uh, people neglected him and oftentimes pushed him aside, and I knew it would be easy for me to to get close to him, uh, to uh, uh, be his friend, if you will. And then again, I also knew if he told that there would be little or uh, uh, small amounts of belief in him. No one would believe him basically if he was if he told. And in fact, they didn't. Uh, when, when, when he did tell, and uh, when it became um, a bigger issue, uh, when I was investigated, the, uh, the, the uh, head of the department of, of my county told me, he said, you have nothing to worry about. He said, we can tell from the very beginning that this is all uh, you know, a big scheme. And it was, it was dropped almost as quickly as it came about. I was caught twice before I was incarcer incarcerated. Um, really, it wasn't... Uh, being called, it was I was told on twice before being incarcerated. They were not believed the first two times. Uh, I had, I had many people, uh, counts, uh, counselors, um, church leaders, leaders of the community, to come up and stand in my defense several times in uh, in those occasions, um, and it was it was simply just totally disbelieved. Even the even the second time, it was it was more stood out against than the first time because they thought. Well, here he goes again, this, this, this young man trying to help unfortunate children, and they're turning against him. And I was even told as much to say, uh, I, had a, I had a minister come to me and tell me, he said, he said uh, Patrick, what's going on is, you'll run across it many times, people you try to help will stab you in the back. He said, roll with the punches, stick with it, you're doing a good job. He said, uh, and in the end, you'll be blessed for it. And in generous things for people. Uh, I would give uh, families money that did not have uh, any money that was not from the church treasury. It was from my own personal uh, bank accounts. 
I would uh, support them in all the ways that I could, uh, talk to them, encourage them. I would go to nursing homes, uh, talk with the elderly, pray with the elderly. I would uh, do community service projects, pick up litter off the side of the road. Um, I would mow the, mow the lawns for elderly and handicapped people, go grocery shopping for them. Um, I would do activities that were centered around the things that young people like to do, not the things that ten, tend to happen in churches which are boring and dull. It was actually very exciting for them, and they enjoyed it, and our youth group grew. It was definitely to cover up what I had, uh, what I had been doing. The, it seemed the more I would get into my deviancy, the more I would try to do that was good in the eyes of everyone else. And indeed, in the eyes of everyone else, I was a good kid. Um, grew up making good grades in school, went to a nice college. Um, all of that just added to, to the double life. I consider people that go to church gullible uh, because they have a trust that comes from being Christians. Um, and other people. They tend to be better folks uh, all around and um, they seem to want to believe in the good that exists in all people. I consider people uh, wanting to believe that these kind of things don't happen, that children don't be, uh, that children shouldn't be molested and that it doesn't happen and it really doesn't happen in my community and in my church. And because of that, it was easy for me to convince them all the more with my uh, good deeds that I had done, with the uh, actions that I had presented to the members of the congregation. Um, I think that, um, that, that they want to believe in, in people. And because of that, you can easily convince uh, with, with or without convincing words. They said, well, we know this young man. He has been in our community f all of his life. We know his parents, his grandparents, his aunts, his uncles. This is not something that he would do. This is not something that goes along with the behavior that we see him in day in and day out. And that was true because I was very careful that they did not see that behavior day in and day out. Most of my uh, deviant behavior happened at nighttime. Uh, and behind the scenes, away and far from any uh, important people uh, who could make those kinds of, of judgments that, yes, indeed, Patrick is the kind of person who would go around molesting children. These kinds of power maniacs are all around us, so please be on the lookout and stay safe. Don't forget to subscribe and leave a comment about what you think. Thanks for watching. Watch this next video.